Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Jessica Clemens, and this is a breakdown of 2014's Godzilla. On March 29th, the MonsterVerse will have added its fifth film, Godzilla X Kong, The New Empire. After welcoming Godzilla, Muto, Kong, Ghidorah, Rodan, Mothra, Skull Crawlers, Skull Devils, Baby Kong, Spores, Behemoth, and Brian Cranston, there's so much in the MonsterVerse to break down and actually explain. So let's get straight into things, and also settle once and for all whether the right Brody died. <gasps> Who said that? Every week I'll be descending into Hollow Earth with you for our MonsterVerse rewatch series and breaking down each and every MonsterVerse film plus Monarch Legacy of Monsters to get us ready to bow to our new king, the Scar King. I'll call this series The Descent into Hollow Earth. That's not good. Uh, the Monster Mash is a title stolen. Heart like Heave, the Hollow Earth and Rockstar theories, maybe God Thrilla, 2K24. You know what? I'll workshop it. But first, be sure to check out nerdriot.shop to check out the latest and greatest in new Rockstar's merch. Right now, you can grab our multiverse tour shirt featuring the many eras of Deadpool. It also comes with a hoodie or a crop top or maybe pick up the Madam Web shirt that has that horrible line that I don't like and everyone loves. Grab some merch from nerdriot.shop is the best way to support the channel and support all the work that we do here. It makes it so Kong doesn't come and beat me up. Uh, Kong beat me up. Okay, either way, let's get into this. If you're watching this, I assumed you've already seen the 2014 Godzilla movie. This breakdown will contain spoilers for that movie and Monarch Legacy of Monsters. Not like huge ones, but definitely ones that will maybe ruin the experience for you if you've never seen it. So you've been warned. The opening gives us the classic Warner Brothers picture logo, then segues us into the traditional Legendary logo. In 2010, Legendary acquired permission, or more so a license, to use Godzilla from Toho and plan to make a film with Warner Brothers pictures. Legendary would produce while Warner Brothers could co-produce produce, co-finance, and distribute. While Legendary and Warner Brothers continue to build our MonsterVerse, Toho's been releasing their own Godzilla pictures, the latest being Godzilla Minus One, which is definitely by far my favorite Godzilla movie. So Warner Brothers Pictures and Legendary Pictures recently renewed their license to make more Godzilla movies, but Toho will be doing the same, and both are just separate in different universes. Not the same Godzilla, but they're gonna both be making a lot of content. Normally, the Warner Brothers picture logo opens with that as time goes by from Casablanca, but instead, this time, it's completely quiet and hollow. Someone's trying to connect their scratchy radio signal, then shrill reverberations crescendo. You can hear this like big band orchestra of strings picking up. So we're all feeling pressured and stressed. Like we're searching for something, but running out of time and we are. The intro montage hurls us into the history behind the famous creatures that came before us. Mostly every image is followed by evidence of their existence, man's plan of attack, and redacted statements that hold some Easter eggs. I love beginning the movie this way because there's no dialogue, and it does such a great job of setting up the importance in the history between us and the creatures to understand where we both are in the world. And if you remember the beginning montage, it's kind of long, it's like two minutes, so I'm going to be getting into it in depth kind of like right now, so buckle in. We start with a cave painting, I believe, of Godzilla, given the spikes down their backs. Warner Brothers, a legendary pictures present. A terrifying tale of disaster and woe. The image depicts St. Bernard the Navigator. The image itself comes from this book. I'll put the title right here. You know your girl can't read that. A book written in 1621 about a monk on a voyage to a strange island where he encounters many monsters. So this is basically hinting at that being a true story. We couldn't find the exact reference for this one, but it looks very similar to the images Hawkins Sea Dragons. Thomas Hawkins from the 1800s was an eccentric fossil collector. He had a collection of ichthyosaurus and plesiosaurus remains, which this appears to be an image of. And I'm sorry, those animals are so hard to pronounce. Charles Darwin's on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races and the struggle for life. This is a book that outlined evolution and natural selection. The original book had only one illustration, so none of these pictures are from that. But this inclusion, again, feels like the filmmakers are trying to ground Godzilla in a real world, but also ask questions like, is humanity the dominant species? Maybe Godzilla is. We get a diagram of different prehistoric animals that we see later during Ford's debriefing scene. Gareth Edwards, our director, had redacted parts of his name. It says, Gareth Edwards' film, that certain magnitude of the weapon is enough to turn everything to dust. Greek pots from 500 BC depicting Hercules battling Cetus, a mythical creature that's probably a titan. Monarch files, where you can see the monarch logo in the top left corner. This is the first time in the franchise we see the monarch logo. It was designed to represent the nexus between myth and science. Additionally, Kyle Cooper designed the monarch logo. He was briefed to be like an M or a butterfly and a warning symbol, and he did all three. This file covers the singing of the USS Maine, which is a real life incident that led to the Spanish and American War, which looks like it was secretly the work of Godzilla. The credit reads Aaron Taylor Johnson had recorded the seismic activity. Activity. References for the seismic activity is just like connected to the nuclear plant in Japan and what starts the movie. The article
article says convinced explosion on warship, not an accident from this real life newspaper headline from the USS Maine. They credit Ken Watanabe of a 1MT surface burst into Bikini Island. We see the Bikini Atoll nuclear test in this montage, which Monarch had a hand in attempting to kill Godzilla, but failing. A lot of this video footage is footage from Vivid History that just supplies you with a lot of history's footage. The next article is about a sunk submarine. Article mentions 25 crew dead. Couldn't find the exact like real article about this one, but clearly something Monarch had a hand in. Lost submarine at last located. Can't find the reference for this one either, but given the copy about recovering bodies below it, I'm betting it's the recovery operation of the Scorpion or the Thresher of the two nuclear subs that were lost. They credited Elizabeth Olsen's name here, emphasized that there are monsters in the depths of the Pacific. Handwritten, it says, destroy the creature. Written under this, it says burrowing. This is hard to make out, but it's the definition of burrowing. This now connects to the underground tunnels and Godzilla vs. Kong and how all of it just connects to Hollow Earth and stuff. Government denies reports of the third missing submarine, probably related to what we see later, Titans feasting on nuclear subs. Noah Chen, our writer, found out in the 60s, four different submarines went missing, and US only has ever lost two nuclear submarines, so this might be hinting a third that was covered up. A species of reptile that we thought was extinct, the animal did not die from the event, it is alive in the Pacific. This could be a report from Bill and Keiko Ronda after they discovered Godzilla was alive during the Bikini Atoll test, where they thought they killed it. The deputy director of Monarch has had some strong cases to eliminate the creature in the Pacific Ocean. To extinguish the threat, it is with executive order that I hereby authorize the operation of MOTO. The creature possesses a threat to the national security of, up to Monarch, to end the terror, that this is for the protection and interests of the free world. We will protect all from here for unprecedented threat from the natural world. This must have came from after Lee Shaw was ousted as a commander of Monarch. We saw this in Monarch's TV show where he was replaced by more gun-ho army types who wanted to kill Godzilla. An old school Navy soldier saluting an American flag credited to Juliet Binoche. And it says here, some specimen have been found that date four million years. And the backstory Gareth and Max created when blueprinting the script was Godzilla and the Mutos could go back 250 million years. Later in the movie, Graham confirms that the planet was highly radioactive and the creature siphoned from that. So this is just showcasing just how old they can be to us when in reality, we don't really know the half of it yet. Footage of an old school fitted diver getting ready to dive in. I'm thinking this is either a diving team that was exploring the wreckage of the above submarines or a team that was trying to get footage of Godzilla underwater. Then we got Godzilla's fins coming out of the water. Monarch boats, the logo on the side of the boat says it all. Credited is Sally Hawkins. It says search there by submarine. A Russian nuclear sub is destroyed later in the movie. TV screen showing divers. I assume this is salvage operations, the lost subs, then an image of a tape recorder. DC scientists are studying life on bikini life before Adam Test. Can't tell if this is real, but Noah found a very similar headline here. Then a shot of Washington men who will study the effect of the atom bomb dropped on Bikini Atoll. This says even with nuclear weapons, there is no guarantee that the creatures will succumb. It is likely the creature will come back with David Strathairn's head. David plays Admiral Stentz, so him dying fighting Godzilla isn't too far off here. Also a nod to show how the movie ends with Godzilla ripping another creature's head off. Shots of Japan, maybe locations of potential bombing sites during World War II. This is an Easter egg that's really funny. Walter Malcolm has claimed that the government men dressed in white lab coats routinely appear at site and Brian Cranston shortly after the event, all residents are sworn in silence. This is just an Easter egg reference to Brian Cranston's roles in Malcolm in the Middle and as Walter White. The document to the CIA about the founding of Monarch knowing what we know. I think this was written by Lee Shaw. Interestingly, the second point talks about their primary objective being research, which is how Monarch started before becoming more secretive and militaristic. The scientist and occult author Richard T. Jones has claimed unique knowledge of the creature's odd mating habits with C.J. Adams. This could be our reference to the Mutos. Monarch's eyes only TV screen. This feels like a training video and I actually kind of love it. The Argonne National Laboratory with the Monarch logo, a real lab found in the 40s focusing on nuclear research. In the Monarch show, Monarch asked for nuclear materials early on, which led to the Bikini Atoll bombing of Godzilla. So I wonder if this is where they came from. Then we have Sarah Haley Finn over the lab workers for the credit. The Trinity site plaque, and additionally, its credit redacted part says, are these animals real? Can we prove they even exist? Or are they merely men in rubber suits with costumes designed by tricksters, Sharon Davis? We may never learn the answer what lurks below. And this is just funny to me because she's our customer and they're just questioning whether these animals are real or they're just in suits. The call response of the bats may give us clues. Visual effects supervisor Jim Rigel has used sonar to map this communication. Then footage of subs and Navy SEALs. Visual effects producer Alan Maris despaired. Sound design by its nature is always Eric Adol. A disruptive and Ethan Van Der Rijn, violent birthing process for all parties. Eric really worked on the audio design for Godzilla's roar, workshopping it for like years. And this is saying the sound design by its nature really speaks to that because you want to make something different, but also representative of a beast that's been roaming the world for so long. Footage of scientists and research the redacted credits here read music supervisor hidden in the depths of Dave Jordan. The thunderous sounds that came from the hills are from large creatures. Later we see how much noise the Mutos make in the hills of Hawaii. High explosive crates. The monster communicates through music composed and conducted by Alexander Desplat, which we later could say, you know, mating calls.
dolls in a way are music, which we see later in the film. American soldiers and sailors with an Asian family kind of looks like Shaw in the Philippines. The Philippines is where Keiko and Shaw first see the Titan. Bill saw one earlier when he was on board the USS Lawton. This is allegedly Operation Tumbler Snapper, a series of nuclear tests in 1952 Nevada. It also resembles the target shape we get around the female Muto traveling through Nevada on the news later in the film. And then it says, not to be discussed by film editor Bob Duxe. The confidential document must not be shared. Monarch training video showing test bases in Marshall Islands, the Bikini Atoll location. The Illuminati has been using production designer Owen Patterson to build facilities to hide their study of the creature and its origins. All clues are suppressed. Monarch's logo on the bomb, then a satellite and radar imagery. The bomb site is classified and will be detonated at 0800 Pacific. Director of photography Seamus McGravy will shoot. There will be no living organisms on the island. Then we get some more Bikini Atoll footage. Executive producers Yoshimitsu Bano, Kenji Okihara are looking into the possibility of hunting Mutos over footage of us hunting Godzilla. More footage here of the Bikini Atoll natives and unfortunately the people living on Bikini Atoll were forced to relocate by the US and were not treated very well at all during the time. Produced by the fire breathing Thomas Tull. Fire breathing is right because this is the CEO of Legendary Entertainment at the time. Nuclear test observers put their glasses on. We saw this in the Monarch show but we also saw this in Oppenheimer. This was shot on the USS Missouri in Pearl Harbor. Then we get some more shots of Godzilla and Bikini Atoll. And then we get a shot of the bomb. This was recreated in Monarch though there are some discrepancies. They painted Godzilla on the bomb but in the Monarch show they didn't really know anything about him at this point including his appearance. This credit sequence makes it seem like Monarch had some idea of Godzilla by the time of this bombing happening but the show retconned this. The final redacted credits say reliability of these sightings is still questionable based on the character witnesses. One must ask, is Godzilla owned and created by Toho Company LTD? Reliability of these sightings is still questionable, which could be a nod to the fact that Monarch has been known to keep secrets and destroy evidence. This is a carcass first described in Japanese story by New Zealand fishermen in 1977. The carcass, David Callum, was decaying and weighed 4,000 pounds. This dinosaur has been dead for about 30 days. Pseudoscientists tried to say this was mere basking shark. This is a sea serpent-like corpse that the Japanese fishermen found off the coast of New Zealand in 1977, and scientists deduced that this was a basking shark, but... Maybe it wasn't. Then it says there are photos of animals yet to be named in the new screenplay by the occult author and nature enthusiast Max Borenstein. He seems to explain what these odd animals are. This could be a nod to the unnamed animals like that carcass of the same species Godzilla in the Philippine cavern that wasn't named. It was just given a code name. Eventually it was named Dagon by the comics. The script is referred to as the new screenplay here because it went through a lot of writers. David Callahan pitched to Legendary and Warner Brothers was hired to write the first draft. Once Edwards joined, Callahan's first draft was rewritten. David S. Goyer was originally attached to rewrite the script who worked on The Dark Knight. Then he worked for a minute and he left. He said it was because he was too busy according to an interview with Collider. Then Max Bornstein continued to write the script. He also wrote the Godzilla comic that came out the same year, going on to contribute to the stories of Kong Skull Island, King of the Monsters, Godzilla vs. Kong, and co-created The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty on HBO. I added that part because I just really like that show. And all of this is to say he's very familiar in the MonsterVerse franchise from the movie going forward, so he had a large hand in the script. Later Drew Pierce polished the last of it, and in 2013 Frank Darabont did the final rewrite, so a lot of hands have touched this script. It's directed by Gareth Edwards, Monsters, the name of the last film he made before Godzilla, and what a great film. Then we're left with the aftermath of the explosion, Grey Sky to Ash and Godzilla's name. This is a remarkable way to introduce the franchise. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. We've all got goals, better work-life balance, stress management, but figuring out how to tackle big goals like that on your own can be difficult. Connecting with a licensed therapist through BetterHelp can help. BetterHelp makes starting therapy easier and less intimidating for a lot of people. The right therapist for you may not be in your area and some people struggle with face-to-face -face interaction of therapy. With BetterHelp, you can have your therapy sessions as a phone call, as a video chat, or even via instant message, whatever's most comfortable version for you. BetterHelp has over 30,000 therapists in their network to choose from. To get started, you simply fill out a questionnaire that will ask you about what challenges you're going through and what kind of therapist you'd like. Then BetterHelp will match you with a therapist and in most cases, it'll take less than 48 hours. Schedule therapy sessions at a time that's convenient for you and if for any reason you feel like your therapist isn't a great fit, you can switch therapists with a click of a button at no additional cost. Cost. Join over 4 million people who've used BetterHelp to start living a healthier, happier life. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash new rockstars. Clicking that link helps support the channel and also get you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. A lot of the footage used in the titles was actually shot as its own scene. They were originally going to start the film with the test of the South Pacific, but to reduce time, it just became the titles. The title sequence was also done by Kyle Cooper, who went on to do them again in Godzilla King of the Monsters. We start the official movie flying over the Philippines in 1999. However, 
However, this actually was shot in Hawaii at the very end of shooting, no less. The Philippines were the location of Monarch's TV show as well. It's where Keiko Mira and Lee Shaw and Bill Ronda all saw Titan together during the 50s, which motivated them to create Monarch. We're introduced to the esteemed Dr. Ishiro Sirazawa, played by Ken Watanabe. The character was named after Daisuke Sirazawa from the original 1954 Godzilla film and the famous director Inishiro Hana. Our Dr. Inishiro is the lead Monarch biologist, and his costume during the scene is based off E.G. Superaya's everyday work outfit on set every day that he wore. E.G. was the special effects director and one of the co-creators of the esteemed Godzilla and Ultraman franchise. He's looking at a pocket watch here, and this pocket watch director Gareth Edwards stole from set. It also makes appearance through the movies. We see it again in Godzilla King of the Monsters. This pocket watch explained later in the movie between Ishiro and Admiral Stenz, but it belonged to his father and stopped on August 6, 8.15 a.m. 1945, the day the atomic bomb landed over Hiroshima. According to Godzilla Awakening, the comic book, his father survived Hiroshima and found Ishiro in the aftermath, though this pocket watch still stopped right there on that time. That watch is a reminder of how human interference in humanity and reckless retaliation can just lead to nuclear destruction and countless lives lost. And like a sad symbolism, Sirizawa firmly believes Godzilla is here for the good of nature. Interfering with nature leads to devastation. Similar to time, nature will find a way of restoring its own balance without man coming in and ruining it. So that watch represents man's foolishness to nature. There are two comic books that are pretty well connected to the monster verse that I've read, and that's Godzilla Aftershock, written by Arvin Nelson, and Godzilla Awakening by Max Bernstein. They're both referenced as tie-ins to the MonsterVerse. Awakening has some great confirmations, but Aftershock has some events that didn't line up canonically and contradicted some of the film. We don't know if it's still canon, but Max offered what we didn't see on screen could have been kept secret by Monarch. Though, I think like Monarch Legacy of Monsters is kind of clearing that up right now. I'm mainly noting this because there might be some stuff I referenced from that material, but you deserve to know whether it's uh, good or not. Honestly, the comics sometimes feel soft canon, but luckily they try to follow the movie's lore. They just want to like blow it up a little bit more in the comics. Next to him, Sally Hawkins, who has joined the cast almost three weeks after filming started. Her character is Vivian Graham, a monarch paleozoologist, recruited by Sarazawa. And what we're seeing here is her first field assignment with Dr. Sarazawa, investigating the collapsed mine that they discover a huge skeleton referred to as specimen 5146 underscore Adam. In Godzilla Aftershock, they revealed the creature as Dagon. This outpost is later called Monarch Outpost 14 in the same novel, a call out to the year this movie came out. This was meant to be a uranium mine. Once they got the signal of radiation a month before they arrived, the men brought their tools that immediately sunk the mine, exposing the underground cavern. Essentially, my understanding is the spores were dormant when they had the radiation they needed. They're generating their own radiation underground. And over time, the atmospheric pressure, let's not forget the mining into the planet, released the radiation as a leak, exposing it to the air, thus waking up the larva in the pod. And if baby's not getting its nutrients, baby's gonna find it, thus leading to the next heavily radiated location, which was the Janjira nuclear plant. The spores in the sunken cavern were explored more in the Blu-ray special features and the Aftershock comic book. According to the Aftershock comics, the earthquake beetle implanted two parasitic spores into the abdomen of the host titan in order to incubate by feeding off its atomic energy. It just laid eggs in its stomach after battle. And that's Gross. So the Moto's first appearance in Godzilla 2014, but we see it again in Godzilla King of the Monsters. In Godzilla King of the Monsters, they refer to them as Titans instead of Motos. In Godzilla vs. Kong, we call them Titanus Motos. Moto also stands for Massive Unidentified Terrestrial Organism. They reproduce in bundles and feed off radiation. And so they need as much radiation for their babies. And back in the day, would just lay their spores inside the adjacent Godzilla specimens. Females tend to be bigger in size than the males can fly, but these are working theories since we haven't seen many of them in Monarch. We're then taken to Jinjira, Japan, a fictional place, which I hope you already know. New, though the mountain in the background is Mount Fuji, which is real, which I also hope you already knew. The score for this movie is also pretty damn incredible. From the cave, you hear the repetitive, distant draws of a violin, like screeching, lurking, eeriness we get in Jaws and Psycho. It builds as it reveals the creature's tracks cross into the water, like the Jaws score unraveling when it's near. The entire orchestra finally begins to sync up, feeling bigger than Godzilla, and it's giving like a horror movie, but because the orchestra is so massive, it feels almost too elegant, but also dramatic. It's all just so beautiful, and it's all composed by Alexander Desplat, a French film composer and conductor who worked on the Grand Budapest Hotel in The Shape of Water, so he's great at composing little freaks. Then we're taken to the Brody family home, specifically Ford's room. Ford was named after Harrison Ford because they wanted him to be like a young Harrison Ford. The Brody family is also named after Martin Brody from Jaws, and there is a ton of homages in this film to Jaws, we'll get into them. His room is set up like any young boy's room would be. Toys are just everywhere, it's a mess. The poster though next to the exit has a lot of Easter eggs. It says, let them fight. Probably the single most popular line from the franchise and has been noted to have imagery that foreshadows the end of the movie. It's Godzilla versus the Muto and the train lifted. They're fighting in San Francisco and you can see the bridge, but below on the ground, he has military tanks, dinosaurs, and soldiers all around his spaceship. All imagery will be seen later in the movie. We don't get a spaceship per se, but the ship looks exactly like the missile we're using to lure the 
monsters at the end. They both also have the same US flag stamp of approval. On Joe Brody's old ass 90s computer in his office is the graph to track the tremors that the creatures are making. In later movies, we see that they use just a seismic reader and Gia to follow their movements. Here we're tracking their echolocation and the electromagnetic pulses they're creating. We're now introduced to Joe Brody, played by Brian Cranston, and his wife Sandra Brody, played by Juliette Binoche. Both work under Monarch as nuclear engineers. And yes, Brian Cranston is wearing a wig because a day before shooting this movie, he finished Breaking Bad. Once inside the plant, the man trailing behind them is Dan Walsh, played by Gary Chalk, the voice actor for Optimus Primal and Beast Wars, and it just feels too easy to not call that out. Inside the control room is pretty sick, and I think this movie did a really good and cool job imitating Japanese power plants and staying as accurate as possible to the 99 aesthetic and design. This nuclear plant location was actually a sewage factory, so it just smelled like shit the entire time, says Gareth Edwards, which again, lends itself to the broad and empty nuclear plant aesthetic without having to build a soundstage. You can just keep it all practical. The crazy thing about this was in the movie, a lot of people misinterpreted the graphs reading for the earthquake. Later, Monarch hides the incident under the guise that it was an earthquake, and three years before this movie came out, it was in development the same year as the earthquake that led to the Fukushima nuclear accident. Seeing as Godzilla has been linked to Hiroshima and the Bikini Atoll nuclear test, fans assume that the 2014 Janjir breach was a reference to the earthquake tsunami that caused the nuclear accident in 2011, especially after Joe confirmed that they had been covering it up, saying it was a typhoon. Gareth Edwards did say, though, in an interview that this film is not based on anything to do with Fukushima. It's a fictional city outside of Tokyo 15 years ago. Next, we see Joe having to say farewell to his wife. She dies at the breach. The closing door scene is just, ugh, it's so rough. This door is like the shutting off of Joe's sanity. In Ford's classroom, we have the cycle of a butterfly with other moths and creatures. We even see a glimpse on the TV of a butterfly hatching from a cocoon, doing the exact opposite of what the Muto is doing to that nuclear plant. The images on the wall show how the larva cocoons and becomes a butterfly. This is an Easter egg for Mothra, and it even shares the same light, similar color design and pattern. Overall, there's a lot of nature, rebirth, biological imagery here that can be direct comparison to the Muto's hatching, Mothra's emerging, and how nature and healing are at the center of this movie. As the nuclear plant crumbles, the windowsill frames the flying origami, dinosaur skeletons, terrariums, another moth, and prehistoric skulls. This was a shot planned to foreshadow the rest of the movie, as Godzilla and the Mutos must fight it out, destroying human civilization in the process, even those children on the bus ain't a good sign. This scene reminded me of how Godzilla and Kong's trailer, we see Gia in her room, and on her windowsill, she has a bunch of animals and a dream catcher. If that scene is like this one, it speaks to the fact that she's in hollow earth, and the abundance of creatures there, she will sense, and there will be a diverse amount and plenty. We jump 15 years later to San Francisco with our baby boy all grown up, now played by Aaron Taylor Johnson, a US Navy EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal Specialist. This man talking to him on the ship is credited as Captain Freeman. He's played by James D. Deaver. He's also Aaron Taylor Johnson's military and expert trainer during this movie. His wife is Elle Brody, played by Elizabeth Olsen. And yes, I completely forgot they were both in this movie. And also, yes, every time they kiss, it made me uncomfortable. They were both cast in Marvel as the brother and sister Pietro and Wanda Maximoff one year after this movie released. But I also think their post-credit teaser came out the same year as this movie was released and it's just gross. Look, I get it, they're actors and they're just acting and this actually happens a lot. It happened with Sally Field and Tom Hanks, Ansel Ugger and Shailen Woodley, Chris Pratt and Emily Van Camp. That one was weird because they actually look like siblings. Like father, like son, Sam has many toy dinosaurs on the table, a dinosaur wallpaper in his room. This is to remind us how many big creatures will destroy destroy his family, but also our little nods to the theme of the movie. On the table is a red dragon, which could be a call out to the entire operation meant to originally take out Godzilla in the 50s. It was referred to as Operation Lucky Dragon. Later in San Francisco's Chinatown and around the Grant Avenue gate, you can see the golden dragons everywhere in the foreground. So this could also lend itself to the luck dragon operation as well. Elle is a nurse and what really struck me is she's wearing a Virgin Mary necklace. The costume designer Sharon Davis mentions in Godzilla Art of the Destruction's book, giving the main cast clothes that reflected their professions and their expertise showcased in functional clothing with Elle specifically in the Virgin Mary, being the symbol of motherhood is just really interesting to me. As Mary was seen as the mother of humanity, Elle nourishes her family and tends to her patients all the time. Nurses are kind of like humanity's mothers. I just thought this was interesting to give her that piece of wardrobe and we don't really see their family being religious. There's an unnecessary amount of green in this movie. Enough for me to notice and that might be a connection to Godzilla being green. And the 1954 Godzilla promotional material was depicted as green, as well in a lot of the Japanese video games made by Toho. We have young Ford in green, the green camo, the ship he lands in San Francisco is green, Green. Later, we get large green lights and more green accents, but the cutouts on the dresser look like animals and the jewelry box is green with spikes. And I'm not saying I'm wrong, but I wouldn't completely knock the green theory here because that jewelry box is hideous. And why add it if it isn't for the tone? 
Then we're in Tokyo, retrieving Joe from prison for trespassing the quarantine zone in Janjira to retrieve documents from their old home. This movie also makes it look too easy to just fly to Japan. That super long flight, I'd be tired. I think right here was supposed to be the Kira Takarada cameo. He was supposed to be playing an immigration officer, and Takarada starred in the original Godzilla 1954 and appeared in a lot of their sequels. It unfortunately was cut and Gareth was gutted about not making it into the film. Though it didn't make the final cut, he's still credited as the immigration agent in the credits. Unfortunately though, he passed away in March of 2022. Once we reach back to Joe's home, the house is a mess. He's Pepe Sylvian all over the place. What's interesting here is their old home is in quarantine zone, which is miles away from the plant. Joe makes note of this because it clearly wasn't a natural disaster. There's something else afoot. Joe has become the crackpot theorist character, which I feel like there's always one in these films. Brian Tyree Henry plays one in Godzilla vs. Kong, Bill Rondo was one in Skull Island, and a bunch of characters fit the bill in the Monarch TV show. Honestly, even Sarazawa in the original 54 film was a crackpot. The old clippings acknowledge the officials can't contain the radiation, the events of the day, even photos of the lab. After Joe shades his own son for working with bombs and Ford corrects him, we then cut to the headline that reads 1954 cover up in the South Pacific, which is both a reference to the key in world events as well as a nod to the year the original Godzilla film was released. We see Joe doesn't trust the government, recognizing how quick they were to hide the massive casualties, and now his son is part of that problem, so he's probably just like shading him because he's disappointed. Side note, if you watched this recently or you just firmly remember this, there's probably a ton of articles you can barely see right now because the scenes might be incredibly dark for you. That's because you might have an older copy like me. Around the time of Godzilla vs Kong, they released an updated 4K for 2014's Godzilla, which looked so much better. You could see more. It wasn't dark and the designs were positively crispy. If you're that person that's like, I don't get it when people complain about it being too dark. Well, find the older version because that was darker than a butthole. That was pure darkness. Next, we get the book on echolocation in bats and dolphins, which is a real book. Then we see a book for parasitic patterns, which I don't think is a real book. But both show how Joe is studying the communication these characters are displaying. The next morning, when he's looking at the photo next to Dr. Serizawa, is a diagram on echolocation in bats signaling to a butterfly or a moth. Clearly, that's a nod to the monster we're going to see later, the flying male with wings. Could even be a nod to Mothra, but this is also a tease to Camazots that was explored in the graphic novels. Gareth Edwards mentioned trying to find lines in the movie that resonated with the theme of the film, and this scene absolutely hit that nail on the head. But you can't keep running away. And son, you can't bury this in the past. Which is truly a note he should be taking, but also does make sense for when the Titans arrive. To not run, just fight. Might be a theme for the movie, but doesn't make it a good idea. The quarantine zone of Janjira City was flipped on its head. It's been 15 years since people have been evacuated and all that's living other than the monarch security and the cocoon being are a bunch of dogs. The whole quarantine sequence is a callback to the monarch TV show, where there's also a sequence of breaking into the quarantine zone to retrieve old data. We reach the old home of Brody and immediately see a bunch of bugs and creepy crawlies, a roach on a military tank, and a literal terrarium that says Ford's Mothra. The egg of Mothra? I don't know. Also, the military tanks that get manhandled later on are probably connected to this imagery. Back at the Janjira plant that we haven't seen in 15 years, the logo is still kind of standing. This movie has some homages to Jaws and Jurassic Park, but for sure that sign is given Jumanji. I love how overgrown everything is. This is pretty natural, but also in King of the Monsters, I think they said that the Titans can terraform or replenish ecosystems, which it really looks like is happening right now. Gareth Edwards mentioned Close Encounters of the Third Kind being a huge inspiration for this movie, and the entirety of Monarch covering up Janjira is really giving Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Also, when he realizes it's a hoax and he takes off his mask, that is also a direct nod to Close Encounters of the Third Kind. You can see the cocoon it's put itself back into in the light up of the embryo holes that were featured in the Blu-ray special features. We saw something similar to this in the Monarch show in the 1950s, where a previously radiated area had no radiation in it because the Mutos eat radiation. So the Muto larva traveled all the way from the Philippines to Janjira, and this is what the spore now looks like. You can even see how the graph matches the same levels the day Joe was trying to set up the meeting from the office. The security guard standing in at Joe's interrogation is wearing a Muto symbol on their arm. Earlier in the film's development, Monarch was originally going to be called Moto, naming themselves after the monsters they searched for. This Moto research facility kind of studied the male Moto while Monarch still existed overseeing it a little bit, because the captain later mentions the US military taking over operations of what Monarch was working on. In this scene, Brian Cranston really ate up this line delivery. He came straight off Breaking Bad and he wanted us to know. And you can't tell me otherwise. He is fed up. He's been searching for the answers and withdrawn from his own family. He yells about the EMP, the electric magnetic pulse, eventually sending us back to the Stone Age, which it will do if the Titans rise up and take over the planet. If remember when I mentioned Gareth trying to find lines in the movie that resonate with the theme of the film? I think this line delivery from Joe is the warning the voice of reason character always gives in movies like this, setting up that we never be prepared for a battle with nature. Then the moment we've all been waiting for, a little over 30 minutes into the movie, and we see our Muto. 
In concept art, the full-fledged design was inspired by King Kong, Alien, Jurassic Park, and Starship Troopers. It definitely has the head of Alien where it looks like it like has no eyes, but it does. Jurassic Park's movements of the prehistoric animals. Also, the scene of it reaching out of its enclosure, breaking the wires, is very similar to the scene in Jurassic Park. The Starship Troopers of it all just feels purely in it being a giant insect, and I still love it. Then Joe falls, and I'm sad to say later he succumbs to his injuries. This feels like the most unforgivable way to die. Brian Cranston really owned this role and I was so sad to see him go so quickly and dirty. At least have him be eaten or something. Ford has now lost both of his parents to the same creature at the same job site. I can't, God. Gareth Edwards backed up his decision killing Joe, though he understands why everyone's upset, mainly me. He said they tried versions of the script where he survived, but then if he was stuck with Ford, it would become the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And if he stuck with the military guys, he'd just be a fifth wheel. I get it, but God damn, he went out dirty. The creature then flies away and this is insane. When they're creating their design, they looked at how like bats sometimes cross their wings. Ultimately, they wanted the Mutos to feel like its wings were capes and the grasp of the wind under that thin layer of skin echoes as Ford passes out. We jump to a news outlet and the cut and editing are so good on this film, but especially right now, because it suggests even in the editing, there's no creature, only natural disasters. It says it was hit by a 6.3 earthquake causing fires and more radiation leaks. And I'm assuming if the radiation leak is true, that has resurfaced from the Muto's spore opening and releasing a little bit of radiation. We're then introduced at the wreckage to Captain Russell Hampton, played by Richard T. Jones. He interrupts Dr. Sirazawa as he looks at all the dead men that were working in the control with them prior to the hatching. They're all just dead. We're at the USS Saratoga now on the coast of Japan. The USS Saratoga participated in the test of the US stage at Bikini Atoll. We're then introduced to Admiral Stance again, played by David Strathairn. Admiral Stance appears in Godzilla King of the Monsters as well, and these guys have to keep a visual pursuit on the Mutos because it keeps wiping out their satellites and radars with their EMPs. All the news footage that we see on the screens was actually shot by Gareth Edwards and the DP Seamus on consumer camcorders. They were running around with soldiers imagining giant monsters were chasing them, and they just had a ball of a day. They began briefing Ford on all the work that they've been doing and the video files log. We learned from Graham and Sarazawa in 54, the first and real operational nuclear powered submarine reached the lower depths and awakened Godzilla. This is the same year the original Godzilla film was released. 1954 makes a lot of cameo appearances. All those nuclear bomb tests we did in the 50s weren't just tests. We were trying to kill Godzilla. So the creatures adapted to deep, deep underground in the oceans to get radiation from Earth's core. And then us bombing everything all the time is no surprise that it alerts them. During the scene, Ken Wanabe is the only person in the film who refers to Godzilla by the Japanese name Gajira. It was important for the actor to use the actual name and he fought for it. Also, every single line read this man has is great, so why not just let him say whatever he wants? Sarazawa says the hardest line again and it resonates with the theme of the movie. Nature has an order, a power to restore balance. I believe he is the power. During the briefing, we get a lot of historical real nuclear test labs and shots. The orange tone explosion we see is the 1953 atomic Annie footage of its blast wave destroying the trees. We get the Baker blast from 1946. Footage of Godzilla we saw from the beginning a little bit. The design of Godzilla is always so fun to see because he's always interpreted a little differently over time. And those are the markings I like to see from the directors on their Godzilla movies. They refer to this one as, and I'm sorry if I pronounced this wrong, Gergoji, which is a combination of the director Gareth Edwards and Godzilla the Japanese name meaning Godzilla. A big part of the design with Godzilla was actually in his dorsal fins. When Gareth Edwards wanted to design Godzilla, they wanted these like hard rock parts just coming out like they were a mountain, which speaks to how Gareth really pushed the nature versus man element in the movie, with some features resembling the Skeksis from the Dark Crystal and movements like a Komodo dragon. They finished designing the Gergoji along with Gil since he's always underwater. The diagram of the animals that we saw in the beginning montage, then we see the diagram of an animal that's currently uncatalogued. It's labeled Species 5146 Adam, which I spoke on earlier is explored in the comic book Godzilla Aftershock and later named Dagon. Monarch footage jumps to an embryo, something moving inside, then to Carmichael's Cave, 1948, suspected Burroughs site. Carmichael Cave is also in Kentucky. We see more Monarch classified footage that we saw in the beginning montage, then a shot of the D1G test reactor, a laboratory in West Milton, New York. This sphere could also contain like huge, huge explosions in case something popped off. That's why it's like a giant sphere. A contact mine being deployed into the water. Then we see more footage that's available in the Blu-ray special features of the Muto and the Philippines. We're then taken to Honolulu, Hawaii in their international airport. This kid in the baseball cap is a throwback to the show era Godzilla films that frequently featured child characters in their similar costumes. We see an iguana perfectly sat in front of the camera before we enter the forest. This could be an homage to the 1998 Godzilla where it was implied that Godzilla was a mutated iguana. I know that this is a nod to Godzilla. There's no way you're gonna put a little green lizard in front of a camera unless it's Godzilla. 
They find the Muto and it's eating a canister of radiation from a ship. This is all a recipe for disaster. An airport and a creature that can shut down all forms of electricity. Planes will be falling down. They had to get approval preemptively before shooting any of the Hawaii stuff, so they made storyboards effective immediately into development and production because it required so much work. The Muto slams its little claw down and unleashes its EMP echo for miles. They confirm on the Godzilla wiki page that the male Mutos can do it within five mile radius because we can see the female one traveling later and she's doing it in a sphere that reaches around like 200. The voice here that says, could be a second bogey, is actually Alan Maris, the VFX producer. The little girl at dinner walks to the edge of the shore to see a bunch of fish that just washed up on land and are dying. We saw this in Godzilla Minus One because Godzilla dragged them up in his wake. This Godzilla pulled the entire ocean tide rising and swimming into Hawaii. Is that not insane to you? His fins rising out of the water coming towards the ship is also in the same jaw spirit. This scene is just so cool and I'm just astounded the difference it made once it was released in 4K. The internet also flagged that the song that plays when Sarazawa was sees Godzilla's dorsal spines protruding from the ocean and when the soldiers shoot at Godzilla as he walks by is actually an update of Godzilla's theme song from the 71 Godzilla and also similar to the 98 Godzilla when Godzilla first emerges on the ocean to the old fisherman in New York. This is also his first appearance in the film and it's a little under 55 minutes. There was a lot of fan criticism on the movie because of this. I actually liked it. I think the story works seeing all the chaos start to unfold and realize it's not Godzilla doing it. There's also this tradition of slow reveals in monster movies that I just What's not to love about it? Godzilla didn't appear in Gajira until 21 minutes into the movie. Jaws didn't show up until an hour in. King Kong set up an entire theme before we meet him on Skull Island. A lot of movies do this. We see a dog tied to a tree escape the tidal wave made by Godzilla, and I don't know if you know this, but if you're an animal lover like myself, there's a website called DoesTheDogDie.com. This tracks more than just animal deaths in movies, but also very harmful triggers, so you're never caught off guard. Though Gareth Edwards did joke that the dog did survive, so I'll, I'll stick to it. We follow the tide suffocating the streets to a building powering off to the men on top of the roof. The red flares spark in the sky, hitting Godzilla like in the leg. No one screams because the fear sets in and then we see the dumbest thing we can do, which is shoot at Godzilla. But he doesn't even care. So he, he gives us zero attention. He walks around a building. The train lights turn back on. That's a success, but the Muto is there, so unsuccess. Then it bites the train and lifts it into the air, allowing people to fall to their deaths. This scene has been done in Godzilla movies countless times, and honestly, it's like a kaiju staple. You gotta have a train. 1954 Godzilla, he's munching on the train. Godzilla minus one, he picked that bad boy up. He just loves munching on trains, and I get it. It's also common to see because there are so many trains in Japan. So if you're a giant lizard that acts like a cat, you're gonna see those trains moving and run at it. It feels like also a heavier homage when we do it because trains aren't that custom here. Also, I don't even think there's a Hawaii International Airport that has a train. Gareth Edwards talked about fudging the scale of Godzilla throughout the film, but genuinely, I don't think anyone really does it correctly. He also increased in height since this film for the other movies. Personally, as long as he stays relative to size with the buildings, I don't really care. Making him the biggest thing on Earth is... Genuinely, yes, very cool, but also I have some limits. Though an additional thing that I like, Gareth Edwards tried to shoot all the monsters only from the perspective that humans would be at to emphasize their scale. So we don't get a lot of drone shots or anything like that. It's mostly ground level shots and that really makes things feel like massive to us. The airport fight could be a reference to Godzilla vs. the Destroyer. They also had a climactic final battle that also took place in the airport. The next morning we see the wreckage left behind by the monsters, a helicopter for the new station KHWA, and misplaced people are everywhere. I might be wrong, but instantly I said, I think this dude is Gareth Edwards, the director of the movie, he makes a brief cameo saying the phones are down. I think I'm right, because only one other person on the internet agreed with me. Ford then talks to Sergeant Trey Morales, and Morales says this. I guess we're Monster Hunters now. Monster Hunter is a Capcom gaming franchise where you craft weapons and armor but also fight giant large monsters. Not as big as these kaijus, but you get the gist. Godzilla's on his way to hunt and the ships are just following. Godzilla isn't preoccupied with us and I love that. He's here to restore nature's balance, AKA destroy the Mutos. But I love this imagery of him actually escorting us when we think we're escorting him. They recognize the spore in Hawaii wasn't actually dormant and when asked where they put it, he says, where you put all your nuclear waste. Yes, Las Vegas is our trash hole. Only joking. It's the Yucca Mountain Nuclear Waste Repository, which is also a real place in Nevada full of nuclear waste. Don't go there. A similar hole to the one in the Philippines made by the male Muto is now created on the side of the Yucca Mountain. Through the soldiers' binoculars, we see a stunning view of the Luxor, Mandalay Bay, and other fine Las Vegas hotels. And oh, what's that to the right? The giant female Muto? Ready to party? This scene is funny to me because everyone's gambling while the news footage says live, terror in Vegas. Thousands are feared dead in Honolulu. In that footage, you see that she's taking down Planet Hollywood. What will we do without Planet Hollywood? I need those jackets. And oh no, she's destroyed 
destroy in Caesar's palace. Where will Celine go? The Farfairs open the doors inside of what looks like the Venetian, but on this side of Caesar's palace is the Flamingo. In the background, that would make that building over there the Rio, and she didn't smash the Rio because my girl has taste. Also, it's playing the devil in disguise by Elvis Presley, which is just so fitting. I assume all of the people of Vegas think this is a giant demon and they're entering an apocalypse where they were not raptured because Vegas is for sinners. A side note that I'm very sure Edwards wasn't thinking about, in Lilo and Stitch, Stitch creates that mini San Francisco scene and destroys it like any monster would do. The next Elvis song that plays in that movie is Devil in Disguise and then he freaks out again. What I love about kaiju movies also is that they always gotta mess up historical monuments or something culturally significant and the female Muto destroyed Vegas's Eiffel Tower. We even see footage of her taking it down in the next scene. Gareth Edwards mentioned taking down Vegas for a kaiju would be like going to Disneyland because it's all miniature versions of all major landmarks. We learned the Mutos have been communicating as mating calls, the females stay dormant, and once the male awaken, according to Dr. Serizawa, their plan is to lure the beast with radiation bomb and then kill them. That's when Dr. Serizawa shares his story of his father with stents and uses the pocket watch as a symbolism of what working with nuclear warheads can do. Edwards is the name of the airplane carrying the soldiers. This could be a direct call out to Gareth Edwards, the director, or just a reference to Edwards Air Force Base, which was a bombing range in 1933 and later became a major bombing training base in World War II. Back with Elle, she's working in the hospital and had to bring Sam, who's stuck on that news station again. He's infatuated with these dinosaurs. The news tells us that people are evacuating California and Nevada. This might just be me being a lunatic. Blame Eric Voss, but the head nurse at San Francisco's General Hospital is wearing this pen with an X on it. And yes, we're doing an X-Men rewatch series that I can't get enough of, but this woman also plays Madeline Drake, aka Iceman's mom in X2. X-Men Days of Future Past came out one week after this movie. So is this a coincidence? Perhaps. But I'd argue it's not a cross. That's clearly an X. Stans is on the red phone, which we know in military movies is a direct line to the president or someone of power. It represents immediate communication. We see it in Dr. Strange Love, even the Powerpuff Girls. Though seemingly a myth about the Washington Moscow Cold War red phone, it always is depicted in movies and books to this day. Behind him is a map of the trajectory of all three creatures. We can see that the female Muto is nearing San Francisco and the male Muto trails ahead of Godzilla still in the North Pacific. This scene alone with the Muto is so sick and we get a clear shot of the eggs that she is carrying. Then she takes more radiation, which great did the opposite of help. See what happens when we interfere. The next day, Ford washes up on the beach. Many of the companions are dead, but we see a coyote, frightened and run away. Now this could symbolize how Ford is alone again, a one man pack like this coyote, but I think it's another Godzilla reference. Gareth Edwards mentions coding Godzilla to bears and wolves. I told myself, okay, I'll let this wolf or coyote slide if I see a bear or an image of one later. At the end of the movie on the dock, we see the California flags proudly waving the bear. In that scene, after fighting like bears, Godzilla stalks and hunts his prey, fighting her in the neck. This is to remind us that they're animals and this lone coyote can foreshadow Ford braving the world alone when he chooses to set those eggs ablaze at the end. Or seeing reflections of Godzilla and nature and humanity through the film and recognizing he's the balance we need. He's everything. I love this film. I love theorizing. All the BART stations are designated shelters. We see one later before the big fight and this is a common kaiju move to hide in a transport station or underground. Monarch Legacy of Monsters were in a train station. Pacific Rim was just underground. Then usually the beast shows up and is like, surprise. Then we jump over to the Oakland, California Tactical Operations Command. Here we find out that they're converging on the bridge where the buses still are. And on the San Francisco Bridge, that should look familiar because it's the same spot used for the Golden Gate Bridge scene in Rise of the Planet of the Apes. There's an immense traffic with the cops and yellow buses are everywhere. Unfortunately, one of those buses hosts Legacy Monarch or Monsters character, Kate Ronda. And if you're keeping up with that show, she only saves like four kids on that bus. Gary Edwards said himself, you can't have a disaster movie without a school bus load of kids on a bridge with a giant monster. It's Cinema 101, you guys. They begin arming the device and it's an homage to the design of the bomb made from the 1964 James Bond 007 film, Goldfinger. Now that they're actually next to each other, the female moto is much larger than the male, which is common in a lot of insects. Female insects tend to be more aggressive as well because the male insects have little purpose other than to mate. Female insects feed, birth, and usually raise their youngs. So I like here we're seeing the male Muto deliver the radiation to the female Muto as an offering because she's his queen. Then her eggs absorb the radiation and they bang. I'm kidding. They don't. They don't do that. But Gareth Edwards did tweet out from the Monsterverse account during the watch along four years ago, every film should have giant monster sex. Hashtag another cinema 101. So... I guess that's our boy. They devise a plan of attack, but I forget that this guy right here is Jared Kiso from Letterkenny. Of course he's a jumper. We get another quote, the quote from Dr. Sirizawa right here. Let them fight. 
Everyone thought that this was gonna be Rodan when the trailer dropped. The similarities are very, very similar, so I understand the call out. One of the jumpers begins praying, and Ford looks at a picture of his wife and kid. This moment reminds us that his dad said to protect his family no matter what, and right before his dad died, he finally got a picture of his wife, it included Ford, so it was a great photo. The green light then switches to red, so we know he's in the zone and what he's fighting for. Then we get the Halo jump scene that's mm, a chef kiss. Halo stands for high altitude, low opening. The song playing right now is Requiem for Soprano, Mezzo Soprano, two mix choirs and orchestra. This is used in like 2001 Space Odyssey and it also sounds like we got a remix version of it in the first Godzilla X Kong trailer. Gareth never heard of a Halo jump, which is I, I guess common, but the writer of the movie suggested the sequence and it clearly worked out. It's featured in Godzilla Kong and the monsters as well to connect to this movie. The Halo jump is freaking sick. I, I said it. It looks like a moving portrait, you guys. The score, the writing, the cinematography all clash beautifully in this moment. Following the dive after a closing prayer adds to the angelic imagery like we're watching angels banished from the skies. Literally, they're falling through clouds, red tails of smoke tracking their descent into a city on fire. Like, this is the apocalypse and I love this movie. On the ground, the female Moto is laying her eggs in a hole she's made in Chinatown. And honestly, I hate it. I don't want to see the scene ever again. But it's kind of funny that she was like, I'm gonna lay these eggs down real quick and then I'm gonna beat your ass. It's like she's like taking off her earrings, but instead she's just depositing her babies into like a ground. This area of Chinatown was the main street set for Zack Snyder's Watchmen also. A lot of big franchises like this use the same sets. We hear Godzilla's massive roar. This roar took two years to make. They found using metal and dried ice created the central design element for the updated Godzilla roar. And you think that sounds easy, but it is not. In college, I took a Foley class and we had to recreate this design and mine sounded like a fart. So yeah, it's really hard. Dried ice super cools certain types of metal and it starts contracting and vibrating and produces this shrieking and bellowing and that's what they used for it. This shot for me must happen in any kaiju movie. When it's a one v one, I want to see them tearing up that city. This shot is also just kind of funny overall because it looks and feels like the shots from an old Godzilla movie, but with the bump of future and money. You know what I'm saying? Like this is some real toe shit. For the voices of the soldiers on the roof, the sound designer made them go outside and play paintball with microphones so they were out of breath and nervous. And I think you can hear it more when Ford is like falling from the plane. When Godzilla is getting double teamed, I just want you to hear how dramatic the score is for a second. Every hit is a noise. Every hit is a dr It's so good. We're inside the Muto's nest and it's actually the same set for the mine in the Philippines that opened the movie because it's a full circle moment. We see a dragon's head under the gasoline and a lot of fans suspected that this nod could be to Ghidorah who would appear later in the Godzilla King of the Monsters franchise. Or it could be Manda from the 63 Godzilla. Godzilla tail whips the male Muto. We've seen him do this against Kong and King Ghidorah in the other movies. This is his great signature. Ford pulls out his gun ready to unload on Miss Muto. Surprisingly though, for a military man that's been attacked like three times now in this movie, he has yet to shoot his gun and he still does it. Then truly the best moment happens depending on how wild you are. Godzilla sets up for the atomic breath. They had so many ideas for the atomic breath, making it electric blue so it gave off the epitome of like a god of nature, but wanting to make it massive like the other movies. They decided to kill the female Muto by opening its mouth and pouring atomic vomit down its throat. They assumed it wouldn't work, but people ended up loving it so it stayed in the film. They thought about just breaking its jaw, but that would have been too close to the 2005 King Kong movie, if you remember that horrific scene. Gareth called it like an almost kiss, and weirdly it sounds beautiful, but nothing's beautiful about the scene. It's just pure wreckage. Additionally, the lore keeper mentioned Godzilla's breath is powered by nucleosynthetic glands in his throat, and I think that's really cool. This also is the only moment Godzilla looks at a human. Gareth Edwards mentioned, it's pretty hard to make a film when your title character never looks at another person. This is also one of the couple scenes where Andy Serkis came in for a few weeks and performed some of the key soulful Godzilla moments, so they could use the same eye movements to give him more like soul. The ship Ford gets on with the bomb says, go whales on the side. This is a reference to Gajira and the Japanese word for Godzilla, which has a combination of the words gorilla and whale. After Godzilla vomits down the creature's throat, separating her head from her thorax, the lights come back on around the city, but the ship Ford's on sails away. And like that, Godzilla and Ford collapse tired from their battles. The next morning, the first responders are saving folks from under debris when Godzilla awakens. On the other side of the story, Elle, Sam and Ford are finally reunited. The stadium is BC Play Stadium, Vancouver, Canada. 
Canada. And I'm sure overall, it wasn't really thought of what to name the stadium because the only stadium in San Francisco, like in San Francisco, is the Chase Center. But that didn't open up until 2019. I think the biggest takeaway, bigger than the arena, is Gareth Edwards says, you can argue that Ford died here and the stadium is heaven. But I don't think he is. I think he's alive. The breaking news refers to Godzilla as the King of the Monsters, an Easter egg for the third movie to come with the same title. Originally, the screenwriter Max made a cameo here, though Gareth said his acting skills were not as good, so they cut it. And I'm sure they just cut it for time. It wasn't his acting. Everybody cheers as the pain Godzilla makes his way back to the water. The Rocky films were actually the inspiration for this end sequence. And I hope you remember the end of the first Rocky movie where he gets his ass kicked, but he wins and screams, Adrian! And nothing but cheers and applause is everywhere. That's what Gareth wanted. Godzilla exits back into the water. Next, we see him living underwater where he's observed by Monarch's outpost and King of Monsters. And that is it for my revisit, my rewatch, my re-breakdown to Gareth Edwards 2014 Godzilla. This movie really set up Godzilla for me and I, in its fandom, it really opened that door for me. I was immediately in love and it fueled my passion in college to watch as many of those movies as I could and I just dove in with my friends. This and Pacific Rim are literally my love language. This journey is just getting started because next week we're breaking down Kong Skull Island. It will probably not be as long as this one. This one is just my favorite one. Huge major thanks to my best friend in the universe, Noah Chen, for helping me write this breakdown. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Lulu underscore Clemens and subscribe to all of our channels and the new Rockstars Network for all that deep analysis that you little monsters can't get enough of. And always remember, let them fight.